This is our lesson number four out of unit number one. It's for March 26, 2017. And unit one is entitled God's Eternal Preserving and Renewing Love. And our lesson four is entitled Restoring Relationships. Our devotional reading is Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Our background scripture is the second chapter of the book of Joel, and our printed passage is Joel, the second chapter, verses 12, 13, verses 18, 19, and also verses 28 through 32. And our key verse as I read from the NIV, is rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. That's Joel, the second chapter, verse 13. Our lesson's aims are to explore what motivates people to repent and seek restoration, the appreciation, the love of God that enables prophecy, dreams, and visions, and to seek restored relationships in personal and community life. Our lesson's focus is on restoring relationships. And one of the lesson's aims is to discuss what motivates people to repent and to return from their wickedness. Um, what is it that prompts someone to be willing to change their behavior, to change their attitude, to change their state of mind? Uh, what prompts us? to want to undergo this form of transformation. And as we look at our lesson today, uh, the second chapter of Joel is actually dealing with uh, two very uh, impactful situations that are occurring. Joel is explaining to the people of the day of the Lord is coming. The vengeance of the Lord is coming. At the same time, he's also alerting them to the fact uh, Joel, the second chapter, starts out by sounding the trumpet to sound the alarm that there is an invasion coming from the north. The Assyrians are coming in to Israel. Uh, and so he is giving a warning at the same time, he's also, as we get towards the end of the lesson, he's also making available to those who would repent and turn from their current behavior to those that would not just display a, a return on a outward expression, but a cleansing, a repentance on the inside. And so what Joel is saying is, is that there is going to be calamity in the land, but there's also going to be God's compassion and God's blessing and God's kindness and forgiveness if we would repent. And it is so fitting today because we have a discord in our nation as it was in the time of Joel's message and prophecy 
to the people of Israel. But we also as a nation have discord and we have a lot of brokenness within ourselves and within the nation. And what Joel is explaining to the people from the inspired word of God is that we can no longer continue with our behavior. We can no longer continue uh, dis allowing the word of God, not showing appreciation for God's kindness and goodness to us. We are going to either have to change our ways or deal with the consequences of our ways. And so as the lesson proceeds, it it is for everybody. No one is escaped. All classes of people all people, all ages of people, all both sexes of people. No gender is escaped. No class, the priest, as well as the young children, boys and girls, the elders, as well as the young people, the middle aged people, those that were uh, nursing babies, those that were um uh, preparing for marriage. It even calls for the bridegroom and the bride to come out of their courts to listen to this announcement because this is going to affect everybody. And the wickedness that was prevalent in that time had come full circle and the day of the Lord was upon the consequences of the people. Now, with all of the warning and the preparation prior to uh, what was about to take place as the Assyrians were approaching the nation of Israel, um, uh, Judah in particular. But as this event was about to take place, a forewarning came. Before the people were about to receive their just due for their participation in what brought about the situations they were confronted with, there was still a warning. A lot of times we don't give due uh, credence, due recognition and credit to God that even after we have gone as far as, as we've chosen in the wrong path, that God still provides a way for us to return back to his good graces. And our focus is on the punishment, the just punishment that we are due. And we begin to question God's kindness, God's goodness, his passion and his love for us. But we don't give the proper recognition to the fact that he sent warning and then he gave us an out. He didn't only just send warning, but he also gave us instructions as to how we could amend our ways. So in the 12th verse of the second chapter of Job, he says, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Now, the King James says rent, but it says and rend your heart and not your garment. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Now, now, what are the guidelines as we as we look at this? Well, the first is to return to God with all your heart. Um, simply saying that we should not be fake in our approach to God. Uh, a lot of times we engage with God as though we're engaging with family members or friends or affiliates or associates or strangers. But God is not a man. Therefore, God knows us. The scripture tells us that he has miraculously, he has wondrously and fearfully made us. 
He knows our inner parts as well as our outer parts. He knows the condition of our heart. So we can't fool God. But a lot of times we get so caught up into the games that we play that we approach God as though God is like us, that God can be manipulated, that God can be fooled. So the first thing God says is, is return to me with all your heart and with fasting. We need to empty out ourselves in order for us to repent to really turn from our ways, we need a cleansing. We need to empty ourselves out and remove from ourselves the things that cause us to be weak and tempted and to continue in our ways. And then we need to show forth some remorse. Uh, it's not saying that God wants us that God wants to break us, that God wants us to be torn, that uh, God wants us to bow down and cry out loud and weep and moan and groan and such. But we should show forth some compassion that we are serious about this change that we're making, that we are sorrowful, that we are sorry for what we've done, the actions and the behavior that we've displayed before God, that we are serious about this. And the seriousness of how we are approaching it should show forth some signs. Now, some may weep from it and others may become silent uh, to the point where they can't formulate the words that they need to say. But we definitely should show forth some sign and it should not be that we come bold and proud with arrogance before the Lord. And as though our attitude is, well, here I am. What do you want? No. No, we can't we can't approach God as though we're approaching a supervisor or a director or someone of equal status. We're talking about the creator of the universe. So it gives us a prerequisite, so to speak. It says, get your heart right. Clean yourself out. Show some uh, passion. Mourn over this. I want you to feel the pain that I have felt as I have had to linger and long suffering and watch you deteriorate and watch you break down from what I've intended for you to be to what you've chosen to become. And then it tells us to rend our heart and not our garment. It uh, was uh, a practice that men, uh, when they would uh, be overwhelmed uh, with certain situations that present themselves to us in life, that there was a practice of showing just how deep they felt about this certain issue in life. They would rent their clothes. They would tear their clothes showing that they were really torn about this particular situation. One situation uh, in scripture that we can live is uh, out of second Kings, uh, the second chapter and the 12th verse. Uh, this is about Elisha when he asked for a double portion of the prophet Elijah. And uh, once he uh, saw Elijah being taken into the heavens in the chariot of fire, then he received the spirit. And when he saw this, uh, because his prayer had been answered, he tore his clothes because he was allowed to see his teacher being taken into the heavens and knew that his prayer was answered, that he would receive a double portion of the prophet Elijah. And so when we see that people are overwhelmed by being restored, overwhelmed by the presence of the spirit of God, it had been a practice that as a, a reflection and as an expression of this 
presence of God, they would tear their clothes. But sometimes we go through the motions. Sometimes we practice things because they appear to make us seem as though we are serious. And here God says, I don't want you to tear your clothes. I want you to rend your heart. I want this to affect your heart because God recognized that it had become a standard expression now that we would use things to be to set forth an impression to others that were watching that, oh, I know that they were serious now. Did you see what happened? He tore his clothes. But God said, I'm not impressed with what you do outwardly for the recognition of others. I'm impressed by what you do internally. I want you to rend your heart. I want you to show that deep-seated compassion from within and not from without. And a lot of times it becomes uh, a standard practice that we go through. And it's very unfortunate because many times we find ourselves in situations in life and we ask for release and we ask to be relieved from those situations. And then instead of sincerely down on the knees of our heart, instead of sincerely changing, we go through the formalities. We cry and, and we, we offer words of, I'm sorry. And, and we go through the acts. We go through the motions. But we know deep down inside, we don't intend to change. And so what scripture is telling us here is, is that if we return to the Lord, if we repent, if we change our ways, then the Lord will offer unto us forgiveness and compassion. How do we know that the Lord had compassion? Well, verse 18 and 19 says, Then the Lord was jealous for his hand and took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. And never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. When we begin to receive the favor and the grace of God and our situations change, when we recognize that we once were in total turmoil, but then things begin to subside and the condition changes. When we recognize that we were devastated and we were without, and we didn't know where our ends were going to come together to bring things to some type of, uh, to some type of order, and to some means whereby we were removed from the constant worry and the constant uh, uh, discontent where we were like confused and puzzled and didn't know how things were going to work themselves out. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we begin to see the problems dissipate we begin to see the worries subside. We begin to see things change. And we know that it wasn't from our old attitude. It wasn't from our old behavior, but it was because of the grace of God. We submitted and then God began to change the conditions that had us so bent over and so puzzled and so worried and so frustrated and so exhausted. Then the hand of God began to undo the situations that we were not able to correct. 
We couldn't do it in and of ourselves. We weren't able to make the change. But because we turned it over to the Lord, because we repented of our ways, because we had a change of heart, because we fasted and prayed, because we submitted our will over to the Lord's will, and we begin to conduct ourselves in accordance with what God said instead of what the flesh said, instead of what my friends said, instead of what society says. But I then governed myself by what creation says, by what God says, by what the maker, the author, and the finisher of our faith said. Then I began to see change, and I knew that the Lord was present. How did I know that the Lord was present? Well, I began to see the bounty of the Lord. The grain was restored. The substance of our daily livelihood was restored. During that time, we were in an agri agricultural age. And so when God restored the grain to the fields, it was as though God was showing that he had relented his punishment, that he had decreased the harshness that we would do, that he had decided to, uh, to uh, reduce the punishment that was due to us. And so when the substance of what we are in need of in order to sustain us and keep us uh, in a standard form of living day to day, when these things are returned, then we recognize that God has shown compassion upon us. Now, our lesson closes out and it starts in the 28th verse. And the very beginning of the 28th verse starts off with a very significant word. It says, and afterward, and afterward, after what? After we recognized who God is. After we lowered our self-esteem and realized that it is he that has made us and not we ourselves. After we lost pride in ourselves and we changed that attitude of arrogance. After we recognize that we need to show love to one another as God has shown love to me. After he had pardoned me, now I must demonstrate his pardon by pardoning others. After he has restored me, then I must restore others that I have counseled and written off. After I begin to recognize that now God has accepted me back into his family, then I need to reconstruct and reconcile my own family members. I need to remove whatever dissension that I caused that drove members and friends and co-workers and neighbors and people in the society away, then I need to demonstrate and show that same love and compassion which was shown to me, and I need to demonstrate that and show it to others. After those things are done, now we get to see the real reward that awaits us because then the Lord says in the scripture that after these things, then I will pour out my spirit on all people. When we are caught within ourselves, a lot of times our expression of love is not for everybody. It's not for all people. 
But God says that when I see you demonstrate who I am in your life, after I see you've repented of your old ways, then I will pour out my spirit on all people. I will have it being expressed through your sons and your daughters. They will begin to prophesy. They will begin to speak of things that have yet to come. But you will know that it is from me when you begin to see the things that they say come to pass. Even your old men, your elders will dream dreams again. Your young men will see visions. They will have foresight. They will have insight. They will be able to speak words of wisdom. They will astonish people by what? Not by their own flesh, not by what we ourselves contain, but because the spirit of God has been poured out own us. And now we're not just expressing ourselves, but we're expressing the spirit of God being ministered to us and then being expressed through us. And uh, when we see these things, it will be because his spirit is present with us. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on both genders, male and female in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, sometimes when we listen uh, to the wording of scripture. It paints a, a very colorful cloud and the translators have used uh, certain uh, translations and wording that uh, has been uh, denoted as a uh, demonic present as the, the doom and gloom. Uh, but everything that God does is for a purpose. And so when we look at a lot of times at the symbolic and colorful expressions of things that God does in the heavens, when we talk about the darkness of the sun and the blood moon, uh, we just went through uh, a period of what they call the Tatrit. Um, and uh, it is a uh, sequential order of what scripture refers to as blood moons. And it's four of them and they occur in like a sequential order. But in reality, although we describe it as a calamity and as doomsday, uh, people interpret it that from the wording of blood moon and the sun is going to be darkened. But in reality, what God is showing us is signs of his coming. And these terms of darkened sun and blood moons are referred to in uh, astronomy as these are lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. And we just had a order of four in the year of 2014 to 2015. The actual dates were April the 15th, 2014, October the 8th, 2014, April the 4th, 2015, and September the 28th, 2015. And as I said, the term is called the Tatrit. Uh, these things uh, don't occur, occur in this sequential order. Uh, sometimes there's a period of about 250 to 325 years in between the occurrence 
of them on those actual dates where they're four in a row. And so, but what we should focus our attention on now, there have been many talk shows and books and DVDs that have been uh, produced and sold. And, and they were talking about the world is coming to an end and, and, uh, uh, this is the uh, end of the world as we know it and so forth and so on. But what we need to really focus on is what scripture says and what the scripture told us is. I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth. Now, at the beginning of the chapter of Joel, he had them to blow the trumpets and sound the alarm. This was done on earth by us. But God says, when I come, I'm going to use my creation to make the announcement. I'm not going to leave this up to man to go to the top of the mountaintop and blow the alarm and sound that the coming of the Lord is at hand. But I'm going to use my own creation to announce my coming. But what our focus should be on is, is that in verse 32, it says, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. On Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance. And the Lord has said among the, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Is the Lord calling you? Then what we have to do is prepare ourselves and be receptive to the call of the Lord. Because the heavens have already declared his glory. We have already seen the blood moons and we've already seen the solar eclipses the darkening of the sun so god is telling us something in his own creation and uh, we should not be of the attitude that we're waiting and counting the days as it were how many more months do i have to do my own thing how many more years do you think it would be before he comes that I can just go on and just be buck wild? Uh, how many more uh, years do you think we can continue to take advantage of people and manipulate them and, and be greedy and seek all everything for ourselves? Uh, what does the clock say? The day of salvation is now. It is at your feet. It is before you as we speak. I would like to close uh, with this. It's at the end of verse 19. Uh, out of Joel, the second chapter. And it says, The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. I will satisfy your needs. I will provide all of your needs, and I will no longer make you a disgrace among the nations. You will no longer be discredited. You will no longer be a disappointment. But if you will turn from your present sins, if you will turn from the crooked roads and the detours that we've taken, then the Lord is faithful and true. And he will fulfill his promises. We hope that, as always, there has been something we've shared with you that will shine some light into your life and that will help equip and strengthen you to be 
the lights that God is calling for us to be in this day and in this time. God's blessings be upon you as always is our prayer.